Each year, nearly five million people visit the American Museum of Natural History. Most pass by a controversial statue memorializing former governor of New York and U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt. It's hard to get perspective on the statue. You really have to be standing in the park across the street to actually get much perspective. And when you do, you see this kind of heroic figure on top of the horse. Teddy Roosevelt, as we've come to know him and love him, with a bandana and his Rough Rider kind of gear. And then there's the two figures, which I think many people miss, in this Indian figure on one side, an African figure on the other. But there's something that's itchy about this statue that rubs us the wrong way, that's just not quite right. When I started to look at the statue, I was just paying attention to the horse. I was just like, oh, a horse. But then I started paying attention to the people, and I was like, oh, like, there's one person at the top, and then the other two are at the bottom. It's a beautifully rendered equestrian statue, but the symbolism of the statue is always problematic. The first impressions of the statue are that it's a magnificent piece of work and that it's massive. It's a reminder of this country's history and what we don't want to talk about. It solidified what happened to some of my own ancestors. It could be seen as a friendship, I don't know. It looks good right in front of the museum also. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, you know, it's a nice, it's a nice, like you can take nice selfies. The fact that the African is naked or practically naked, we're calling them a primitive society. I know it hurts a lot of my people in particular. It hurts a lot of minorities in general. People have protested the statue for decades. And today, these voices are intensifying. We're here to show our dislike for that statue and say our demands that we wish for it to come down. When I look at the statue, I do see a commentary about white supremacy. It has acquired that reputation as being um, a monument to uh, racial supremacy. It represents a racial hierarchy, and it pains me that that might be part of the experience entering the museum. The fact that monuments and memorials in New York are controversial isn't new. They often become, because it's public space, sites of protest, places to rally, places to celebrate. That is the role of public space. It's a space of contestation. Statues are powerful things, and we're taking a hard look at our history, and how do we deal with that? After Roosevelt died in 1919, the state of New York set out to create a memorial to honor him as a nature lover, explorer, and author of natural history. The state of New York wanted to memorialize TR as one of the great New Yorkers. It made sense to the Museum of Natural History because the Roosevelts had such a great history here. Our charter was signed in 1869 in his father's parlor. He was a blue blood kid from an aristocratic New York family who goes on to live rough on the range as a kind of cowboy. There's the Rough Rider legacy of him on San Juan Hill that makes him a war hero. At the time, he was a larger-than-life adventure hero type of figure. Yes, he was a naturalist. Yes, he was a kind of explorer, but he was also the president. He is our great conservation president. During his tenure in office, he saved over 234 million acres of wild America, places like the Grand Canyon, Mirror Woods. This is part of the enduring legacy of Theodore Roosevelt. Architect John Russell Pope won a competition to design the memorial at the museum, consisting of a new building, murals, and other works of art. Sculptor James Earl Fraser was chosen to execute Pope's vision of the statue, which was unveiled in 1940. Pope specified an equestrian monument, Roosevelt on the horse, and two figures standing next to him. And the entire group, not just Roosevelt, was intended to be heroic. The allegorical figures, and these are Fraser's words, may stand for Roosevelt's friendliness to all races. The figures represent the continents on which he hunted as either gun bearers or guides or both. People refer to this figure as an African-American. That's totally impossible. We know he represented the continent of Africa. 
The African figure is conjectural in a way, it's sort of not known. So you get a sort of classical kind of body figure, very stripped down, without much in the way of accoutrements, a sort of robe that leaves the figure more exposed. The Indian figure has detail on it. The blanket, it has a beautiful medallion, the headdress has some detail in it. So the Indian figure is known in that sense. He was probably intended to represent a Plains Indian warrior. There's a kind of freedom of interpretation because it represents more than a single portrait. It's a composite of many tribes. The positive aspect of the statues is that it's done with great skill. The artist was very competent and knew how to show Roosevelt as the powerful figure by putting everybody else in his wake. Here was Theodore Roosevelt, great American figure, stalwart, riding on his horse. I mean, he's holding the horse, it's reined. It always to me seemed like a narrative of domestication, like the horse has been tamed, the Native American, the indigenous populations had been tamed. The conquest of the African continent was also about sort of taming the savage, right? The savage beast. And that was the narrative that was communicated to me. For an American Indian person looking at the monument, there's a, an experience of pain that comes with it. Indian figure is sort of cast as this sort of vanishing, disappearing figure of the past. To see that representation and to understand that the representation has had all kinds of consequences, it's not a pleasant experience. I don't feel offended by the statue. I feel like they did something wrong with the statue. It's, it's not right. Maybe the intention had been to make awareness of Native Americans and Africans, but it just came off all wrong. It would have been better if the two guys were both on horses, because then it would have been like, we're all like equal and all the same. The sculptor, James Earl Frazier, I don't think he means a slight against Native America or Africa, but we are so distant from his mind as living cultures. We're the symbols of primitivism, we're the symbols of nature. I think their faces are dignified, but, you know, at what cost? Because, you know, they don't seem like free men. I see colonial power. The standing figures were taken to somehow be lesser than Roosevelt because he's on the horse and they're standing on the ground. That, of course, looks extremely prejudicial. That's how we would see it today. If we see it in the historical context and we see the two standing figures as having allegorical content, uh, both representing continents and representing figures who would have assisted Roosevelt on his hunt, then we see it in a different context. I think Frazier, as a sculptor, meant to depict them in a very sympathetic way, with dignity. You know, you don't see the cigar store um, Indian, as, as they were called. You don't see, you know, the comic African with the bone in his nose. It's a beautifully crafted work of art, but there's always an aesthetics to race. Roosevelt was seen as a champion of uh, conservationist science. Conservationism gave us uh, our national park system, and Roosevelt's probably best remembered for that. Most people don't know that a lot of these national parks were made possible by the evacuation of indigenous populations. Roosevelt says something like this, I'm not gonna go so far as to say that the only good Indian is a dead Indian, but in nine of 10 cases, I believe that to be the case, and in the 10th case, well, you know. So you couldn't call him a friend of the Indian. I would absolutely call um, Theodore Roosevelt a racist. His views on race come out of his class position, come from a certain moment where that particular class had an extraordinary amount of wealth and power at the turn of the 20th century. You have to look at people at their time period, and Theodore Roosevelt, 1901 to 1909, if you're comparing him, he was quite enlightened and he invited Booker T. Washington to the White House, and this created a huge outrage. Never before had an African-American sat in the White House, and T.R. got hammered for this. After his presidency, Theodore Roosevelt goes to Africa. Who else in America was doing that? On the other hand, he was an imperialist figure there. 
when you read some of his writings, you cringe because it has such a feeling of white supremacy. It shows a portrait of somebody feeling that tribal people in Africa are not very high on his Darwinian scale. He had very specific views around which races, the Nordic, the Alpine, were going to lead civilization forward. And then there were those that you didn't want to mate with. Roosevelt was very much a part of that debate around whether or not you could actually breed better humans. This feels called eugenics, which also became very popular. The American Museum of Natural History was also involved in this misguided movement, hosting two conferences with displays in the 1920s and 1930s. You can take your pick of American presidents who have perpetuated the theories of racial segregation and racial subordination. He wouldn't be the first that would come to mind. But the placement of the statue, the existence of the monument, the dialogue that it generates with the public, combined with the colonial framing of the museum itself, is what makes it distinctive. And that's what makes it so problematic. I've been here for parts of five decades, and in every one of those decades, we've had protests against the TR statue. The political reality is that that statue is where it is because that's where the state of New York wanted it. I think uh, statues should be where they are. Should this be on the main street? Should this be in the front of the museum? No, I will put a dinosaur uh, <laughs> over here. Something, anything else but this. I leave it up, for sure. They're still a part of history. I don't believe they should be destroyed, but I definitely think they should be taken down. Leave it as it is and let it, you know, let it represent the time that it was made and we know better now. I think I would, I would move it inside the museum and put something else here. I don't know if it necessarily needs to be taken down because if we, if we take it down, then we erase what happened and we cannot really erase what happened. We've just got to like be able to move forward. In 2017, the mayor of New York formed a commission to examine troubling monuments throughout the city. But the commission was unable to come to a consensus on what to do about the Roosevelt statue. The mayor decided the statue would remain, with additional context and the possibility of adding new works of art. I voted to remove the statue. I thought it should be removed elsewhere on grounds, not be removed entirely but moved elsewhere and then contextualized. I personally would be opposed to removing things. I think it's better to expand the people that are being honored in our public spaces. I would remove it from public view. I think it would be a long overdue act of racial healing in this city. I don't think it deserves to really occupy that prominent position any longer. I'm not inclined to tear things down because I really sincerely believe it erases history. And history is hard and unpleasant, but um, we need to talk about it. I think it's wonderful that there is a conversation about what we're seeing because there are so many different views now and I think the conversation can change because of education and what we hope for in the future. So, I mean, that's the power of sculpture, <laughs> says the sculptor. <laughs> Museums should not simplify stories, we should complicate them. Teddy Roosevelt deserves to be memorialized for his contributions to conservation. We should also acknowledge his race politics. These were complicated figures. It's not an attack on the legacy of Roosevelt, but it is a request that we think about what we put on display in light of what we do and how we think and how we feel in the, in the present moment. Let's think about sort of ways in which we commemorate, but also look to the future. Now that our politics are becoming more diverse, people are asking, can we have different representations of people and events 
um, and histories, not a single history, but multiple histories and monuments and markers in the United States, I think, can speak to those multiple histories.